Cognitive dissonance. It's where you save up a long time to buy a Rolex Daytona, but realize you can't actually have one. Rationalization is where you watch YouTube videos to convince yourself that you never wanted one to begin with. <laughs> We're going back to Psych 101 today, guys. I'm Max and this is WatchCrunch. WatchCrunch.com is an online platform that we just launched for watch nerds like us to have a place for more positive and productive watch discussions. More about that at the end of the video. So in the 1940s, countries around the world worked in secrecy to develop the atomic bomb. You may have heard of the Manhattan Project, knowing that whoever got there first would decimate their rivals. A couple decades later, a similar, albeit less life and death storyline would play out in the race to build the world's first automatic chronograph movement. Now, instead of communists and Nazis, the players here will be a group led by Jack Hoyer with the Caliber 11, Seiko with the 6139, and Zenith with the aptly named El Primero movement. By some wild coincidence, they would all cross the finish line the same year in 1969, Though Hoyer slash Breitling would claim to be first, the El Primero was by far the most elegant, the most compact and advanced movement out of the three. The Chronomaster Sport is the latest torchbearer of this illustrious history. Offered in both white and black dials, these modern chronographs represent Zenith's latest design language. Though some will say that it looks awfully like a Rolex Daytona, Zenith will tell you that it actually draws DNA from its own DeLuca, a vintage chronograph with a panda dial. The first reason why this might have a leg up over the Daytona is that it has a thoroughbred racehorse under the hood. This movement beats at an astounding 36,000 VPH. By some simple math, this gives us 10 times per second, which last I checked is a lot easier for measuring things than trying to divide by eight. But you might say, in a world of smartphones, who's using their watch to time things anyway? Well then, at least this chronograph doubles as a cool party trick. Spinning at a dizzying pace around the dial every 10 seconds, the first time you see this, it kind of takes your breath away. And you swear something has snapped in the movement and the mainspring have broken loose. But here we get to my first critique, which is the verbiage on this glossy ceramic bezel. I think they could have gotten away here with just the words, 10th second instead of this complicated fraction and phrase. Maybe if they did that, then they would have had enough space to retain the first second marking. Speaking about the movement brings us to the second reason why this watch might be cooler than a Daytona, is that you can actually see it through the case back. Now, Zenith watches have always led with their tech. In fact, the Rolex Daytona used a detuned version of the Zenith El Primero movement all the way up to the year 2000, making these two companies' past relationship that much more fraught and complicated. The new El Primero 3600 is a sight to behold. You're greeted by a miniature metropolis of gears and levers, and you get lost tracing the action of its column wheel lateral clutch operation. It takes a lot of energy to drive the chrono hand this fast, and Zenith achieves this feat with a lightened silicon escapement and many other energy saving tweaks I won't pretend to understand. I'm mostly just distracted by this large gunmetal rotor proudly featuring a Zenith star. So like a couple of scorn lovers, Rolex broke up with Zenith in 2000, and now it's taken Zenith two decades to get back at Rolex. Guys, take a second to hit that like button and consider subscribing if you enjoy these terrible metaphors. For point number three, let's turn to the design. Yes, it has a black ceramic bezel and a white dial, but just look at those tri-colored registers. You'd think this would be a little too festive for a serious chronograph, but it actually works because the running second and the 60 minute counters are shades of gray, so those are not colors. And the 60 second subdial is this cold steely blue. Those slightly overlapping circles make for enough of a pop to be visually interesting without being overly distracting. 
And it also defines the classic Zenith chronograph look. But where Zenith really couldn't help themselves was at the bracelet. Just like the Rolex Oyster, it has polished center sections and a rectangular folding buckle. This was one bridge too far for me, so I've chosen to wear the watch on this Cascadia rally strap. Now, Cascadia is a company local to me that makes high quality straps for sometimes half the price of competing brands at this level. I'll put a link to them in the description. Now, point number four may be personal, but it has to do with the utility of a chronograph for its primary function. See, the Daytona has screw down pushers. Yes, that's better at preventing water intrusion, but to me, what's the use of a chronograph if you can't quickly start and stop it to time something? I mean, by the time you unscrew the damn thing, the race is half over. I know it's the classic robust look of a Daytona case, but to me, that's more decorative than functional. Okay, Max, you might say, let's be real. The true utility of a chronograph these days is just an expensive fidget toy for adults. But for that reason, I still prefer to have the tactile feel of that column wheel a click away. The last reason you might prefer the Zenith Chronomaster Sport is price. Now, neither of these watches are cheap retailing north of $10,000, but as we know, only one of them you can actually walk in and buy right now. And I'm not gonna jump all over Rolex on this. They can only make so many watches a year. I think it's more of a sign of the times. As we know, the pandemic has made rich people even wealthier and with the inflation looming, everyone's trying to stash their cash in some appreciating asset. And you see this happening with everything from watches to real estate to NFTs. But the sad reality is that we're comparing a $10,000 watch with something speculating at three to four times that. And that just doesn't make sense anymore if you're comparing merits. So yes, I would take a Daytona over the Zenith. I'm not dumb. There are just as many reasons that we didn't mention why the Daytona is a better watch. For example, the Chronomaster Sport is kind of tall, doesn't sit flush on the wrist like a Daytona, but that's a whole other video. The point here is that when you look closely, the Zenith is its own watch with its own history and not some cheap Daytona knockoff. But what do you think? I invite you to continue this conversation with me on WatchCrunch. See, we developed WatchCrunch.com because we got tired of our collective negative experiences on traditional forums. So we built a place with a sleek interface and engaging content for watch nerds and by watch nerds. We're actively adding new features as we speak. So come check out WatchCrunch.com. I'll put a link to a thread on this very topic in the pinned comments below. As always, be well, and I'll talk to you next time.